Hi, good morning and welcome. We're going to ask everyone to get seated. We'd like to start promptly at 9. and then you put people out in the field. That's, I don't set up here, do I? I don't think so. Yeah. I'll just stand over here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, that was lame. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, right. <laughs> I'm Ali Malek, the president of Roosevelt University. And welcome. Welcome to real discussion about social justice, about progressive causes, about diversity, equity, and inclusion. At the same time, when parts of our nation are making this kind of discussion, illegal, unlawful, we are doing the absolute opposite because that's the legacy of Roosevelt University since our founding, okay? And our students, uh, because of the devotion of our faculty, need to understand the history of our nation. You know, good, bad, or ugly, the only way we can progress, the only way we can progress is for everybody to understand our legacy and do better every day, in every classroom, in every graduate who walks across the podium to receive a degree. So that's our legacy. And with that, I am going to introduce my great colleague, Dr. Dalmich, to get us started today. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. We are on the traditional and unceded homelands of the Ojibwa, Odawa, and the Potawatomi nations. We honor with gratitude this land and the indigenous people who stewarded it through generations. We recognize the indigenous people who laid the foundation for this city, as well as the diverse indig indigenous nations that reside here today. We vow to do our part to right the historical wrongs of colonization, to support indigenous communities' struggles for self-determination, and to be better stewards of the land that we inhabit. Um, I want to thank our um, co-sponsor, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Roosevelt University. I want to give special thanks to our panelists for coming at such an early hour, and all of you for coming at such an early hour. There's more coffee. Uh, <laughs> I would like to thank Keturah Brown with the Office of President and Director of Events at Roosevelt. She, um, I have less gray because of Keturah. Thank you so much. Um, Stephanie Farmer, my colleague, my friend, where is she? Thank you. I so appreciate you. Uh-huh. See? You're following. I know it's coming back. 
Um, and I want to thank the Mansfield Family Foundation that makes this event possible, makes the social justice work we are, we are doing in communities, in lifting our students and bringing together theory and practice through the university. Um, and with us today, Mimi Hopmeyer, maybe wave and yeah. And um, on stage with us is Benetta Mansfield. You'll hear more about and from her in a bit. And her husband, Kelman Resnick. Are there any other Mansfields with us today? Yeah. So we, we thank the Mansfield Family Foundation. Um, I am going to turn the mic over to said colleague and friend. Her research, Stephanie Farmer's research, focuses on the interaction between urban public policy, public-private finance, and the role of labor and community activism in shaping Chicago public schools, our transit system, and infrastructure. She is engaged in community, scholarship, mentoring students, and building toward a more just world. I'm turning the mic now over to Stephanie. Can you guys see me? Like, <laughs> I'm standing on my tippy toes. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Um, my job here is just to provide a bit of the framing of the background that led to the um, election of uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Mayor Brandon Johnson. And um, I want to focus on the people's power movement that is standing with Johnson in, in, in trying to advance a people-centered agenda. So Mayor Brandon Johnson's victory bucked the three-decade-long trend of Chicago being led by a mayor for the 1% who builds a cushion of wealth and privilege in the city core while siphoning off dollars out of the neighborhoods to pay for it, and then over-policing those communities to keep them in line. In a city with a one ruling party, the Democratic Party, committed to the 1%, the multiracial working class needed an independent voice in politics to promote their issues centered around the investment and uplift of communities left out of the neoliberal bargain, like the need to tax the rich to expand affordable housing, improve mass transit, and invest in neighborhood public schools. I got a slide. You all? Put it up. Oh, okay. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. So, Standing with Johnson is a multiracial working class coalition composed of unions, community organizations, community labor organizations ward-based independent political organizations, and radical economic and racial justice movements. While this myriad band of political actors build power in a variety of ways, in their workplaces, in their communities, on the streets, to some extent, their demands engage the formal political process where people-centered policies are funded and enacted and people-hostile policies can be dismantled. To achieve electoral and institutional power, this multiracial working class coalition formed the United, Workings Party, uh, United Wor <laughs> Working Families Party. I am a professor, but I can't read. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so they formed the United Working Families Party in 2014 to pressure the Democratic, Democratic Party from its left flank. While they meet be unable to match wealthy donors dollar for dollar, they are crushing elections with people power. Um, United Working Families Coalition members are already organized in their unions, in their communities, and various other kinds of political organizations. So the coalition combined their existing organizational power and transformed it into electoral power. Um, United Working Families adopts a strategy to, in their words, recruit, train, run, and win with black and brown candidates who come from the rank and file of our movements for racial, social, and economic justice. United Working Families host leadership academies to train and recruit the next generation of leaders. Both uh, Congresswoman Delia Ramirez from the 3rd District and Mayor Brand Johnson came out of United Working Families training and leadership 
relationship development programs. They provide media, volunteer, door knocking, and fundraising support for candidates. And when candidates are elected, they hold governing schools to teach electeds how to win the people's policy agenda. Today, you will find United Working Family endorsed candidates at all levels of government serving Illinois, from the Congress to the State Senate and House, Cook County Commissioners, and the City Council, where United Working Family now controls about 24% uh, of the council seats. And now the people are in the position to pull the levers of power for the city for the first time since Harold Washington um, with the election of Mayor Brandon Johnson. Mm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. When in office, United Working Family elected leaders are reversing policies that control black and brown communities and restore working class power. In addition, Johnson's administration appointments come out of the movement. For example, Johnson's CEO of CPS, John N. Shee, is the director of the parent-led Raise Your Hand movement. When before, appointments typically went to somebody from the financial sector or from the 1%. With a left power us have to fight just a little bit a little a little less harder to achieve their goals um, mayor uh, Brandon Johnson for instance appointed alderwoman uh, Rosana Rodriguez as chair of the health council in this position she can prioritize her treatment not trauma initiative which seeks to replace police responders with social workers and counselors to respond to calls from the mentally ill and reopen public mental health centers closed by Mayor 1% Rahm Emanuel. <laughs> right? Wait a minute. Okay. Yeah, and in, 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 in his um, November people's budget, in his first people's budget, uh, Mayor Johnson actually funded the or funded some of the initiatives behind treatment, not trauma, along with other types of economic and racial justice demands. So, you know, I, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I could let you read all this. I, I don't want to read it all to you because you guys can read it, I'm sure. <laughs> but the point is, this, this is what the left is doing or the progressives are doing when we have power. But there needed to be an intentional strategy to build that power. And here we are today where we are going to have the mayor of Chicago emerging from this movement of people power to represent us. So. Our panelists are many of whom are from the um, organizations that founded United Working Families, or they come from the racial and economic justice movements, and they're gonna tell us more about how the people built power and what we need to do to keep it. Thank you. All right. Hi, we are going to switch mics. Hello, hello, okay, terrific. So I want to introduce our moderator, Amisha Patel, and tell you a little bit about Amisha, and then I'm going to turn everything over to Amisha and our wonderful panel. Amisha Patel has 30 years of experience organizing for economic, racial, and gender justice. She served for 15 years as the executive director of Grassroots Collaborative, it's an innovative community and labor strategic um, coalition building campaign that they built campaigns, many of which built the foundation for the progressive movement victories that have happened in Chicago. She also served as a senior advisor to the transition team um, for Mayor Brandon Johnson. She has been recognized broadly, Crane's Chicago Business 40 Under 40 Award. Her op-eds have appeared in Crane's Chicago Business, Bill Moyers, In These Times, Chicago Sun-Times, to name a few. And in the interest of time, because this panel is so amazing and I want you all to hear what they have to say, I'm going to stop telling you about Amisha and turn the mic over to her. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be here today with all of you and with this incredible set of organizers and strategists on the stage. Um, uh, you know, I think as, uh, as Stephanie laid out, we're in a very powerful ascendant moment. 
that has taken really decades. I'm going to take it beyond where Stephanie started, and it's actually multiple decades of organizing that has led to this moment. That led to this moment, um, and you know of community organizing, labor, power building, um, grassroots organizing all together, uh, and taking bold action. And Chicago is a place where we, we take bold action. We're not afraid to lose. We often lose, right? But we know we lose forward, and um, we are building power as we go. And I think we've seen the results of that. You, you have to think big. You have to have an auda audacious vision, um, and you've got to have the people with you to be able to implement and build and make that vision possible. So today we're going to think about the long arc. So the past of what is it that what are some of the pieces that led us to this moment? What is a little bit of an assessment of this current moment? And then where where are we going next, right? What what is necessary to continue to build? Because we all know that it's going to take many many years to get to the world that we want and to get to the Chicago that we want. It's not going to happen in one term. Um, it's going to happen over many years. And so I want to also you know, help us look at what is actually needed to be able to make that vision possible. So, you know, the rise of progressive power has, of course, led to increased attacks. So you're seeing that play out in the city in real time, um, both in terms of the conservative right, in terms of the mainstream center, and also in terms of the left, right? Like there are attacks coming from every direction. So what we're gonna talk about today is a little bit of just you know, diagnosing the current state of affairs, but also um, what are the paths forward? So I'm going to, let's dig right in, because we don't have a lot of time. Um, the, the, we're going to have a set of questions that the panelists will engage in before the mayor arrives. The mayor will join us for another set of questions, and then the panel will um, kind of have some concluding remarks, and we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So um, for just about four minutes each, if each of you can introduce yourself quickly, um, share what your work has been over the last decade or two, and one thing that you think was key to making this moment happen in Chicago. Um, we'll start with Andrea, and then we'll just we'll just move our way down. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? There you go. Uh, my name is Andrea Ortiz. She a uh, pronouns. I am the director of organizing for the Brighton Park Neighborhood Council. Uh, born and raised on the southwest side in Brighton Park, a block from BPNC. And I also sit on the executive committee for United Working Families and served as Brandon's southwest side field director um, during his mayoral campaign. Um, a lot of my work has been, for the past eight years, has been doing multi-issue intergenerational organizing in the community, especially on the southwest side, where we're engaging predominantly like immigrant families, young people, parents, who get involved through like our services and programming. And I think what has been really important for us is that we're building campaigns and making demands based on the needs of our community members. So when elections come, candidates are very clear where community is. And one example is the treatment at trauma campaign. Our community from the beginning has been very clear. We need public mental health infrastructure in Chicago, and we also need a non-police crisis response model. And we made it clear that we are gonna support candidates who support reopening those centers, who support implementing a non-police response model, and really made it a wedge issue over the past couple election cycles. So when Brandon was elected, he was able to run on the demand that like, I support reopening these centers and implementing a non-police response model, and I promise you I'm gonna make it happen in this past budget. We were able to win two centers to be reopened, which is huge, and also the expansion of the non-police response model and expansion of the services already in the existing um, center. So you all could clap for that, it's huge. <laughs> And I say it's huge because we, before Brandon, we weren't even able allowed to get a hearing in city council, which is the bare minimum. Um, so being able to listen to community and making sure that these demands are coming organically from community and then making sure candidates are being held accountable to that, I think has allowed us to build that power.
Um, my name is Alex Hahn. Um, I am currently the executive director of In These Times magazine, um, which is a Chicago-based and long-standing magazine of social movements, uh, progressive electoral politics, um, and, and progressive change. I spent most of the last two decades, though, as an organizer in the labor movement, uh, primarily with SEIU Healthcare, Illinois and Indiana, um, as an organizer, as a vice president, as an elected leader. We had a lot of success um, in very difficult times in organizing home health care workers and organizing and building a, a really strong union. When I started as an organizer, and I'm certainly not trying to take the credit for all of this, um, but in 2001, when I started as an organizer, um, our union was 8,000 members. And by 2012, we were representing over 90,000 workers across the Midwest. Um, but yeah, and it's, it's a really remarkable growth, um, but our political power and the political power of working class people and of workers had not grown um, in that same way. And so we saw a real need um, to develop. We, we saw that the traditional way of doing politics was not um, doing what it needed to do. Um, for our members. And so we joined together with the Chicago Teachers Union, with Grassroots Illinois Action and Action Now um, in 2014 to form United Working Families, to be a political expression of the politics that we thought could be transformational for the future and actually help us build power. Our gains were ephemeral without being able to build structure um, and institution. And you know, I, I think about a specific moment that I think was critical. A lot of times I go back to this, and I hadn't thought about it till a moment ago. But 15 years ago, uh, a group of about 300 workers at a window and glass factory on Goose Island um, had their factory, their owner had announced it was shutting down kind of overnight. A bunch of them had worked there for 20 years. They were going to lose an enormous amount of their you know, the, the pay that they had earned over the years, their kind of vacation pay, their retirement. And so they decided to take the really radical act of occupying their factory um, to win back the things that they had earned over the years. I think about that because I remember a few years ago helping to organize an event where leaders from the mental health movement um, who launched the Treatment Not Trauma um, campaign in the, in the wake of, of the, the closure of the mental health clinics came to uh, Republic windows and doors to bring food and supplies and to bring support and to learn from the tactics that were used. Uh, leaders who would go on to lead the Chicago Teachers Union but who at the time were forming the caucus of rank and file educators and in 2010 would go on to challenge um, for and win leadership in that union under the leadership of, of Karen Lewis um, were there um, on the ground. Uh, leaders who would go on the next year to form the Immigrant Youth Justice League. There, there's just so much of a lineage of, of what has actually helped to make change happen over these last couple of years. There are a lot of different moments that I think we can look to that were critical points, um, but I think of that really brave occupation of the Republic Windows and Doors factory in 2008 as a really critical moment. Yes, yeah, so hello, my name is Richard Wallace. I got a preacher's voice, I apologize. <laughs> um, and I'm the founder of Equity and Transformation, which is a nonprofit organization here in Chicago. But I'm also a Roosevelt alum. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I entered here as, a, as an artist, a rapper, and I left an organizer um, under the professorship of Heather Dalmage, uh, Mally, Bailey, and then I took class at you as well. Um, everyone um, really radicalized me, but then I met a professor named N. H. Choi, an instructor, um, who I was burnt out on sociology, because at the end of every theory, it was like nothing changed until revolution or resurrection. <laughs> and um, I took a class, in, a class on community organizing, and N. H. taught me that we can make small changes um, towards that larger vision, right? Um, and I ended up getting a job in the temp labor sector, organizing temp workers in Chicago, um, which is a big shift from rapping on stages. Um, and so I think what's changed, I wanna lift up um, names like Fred Hampton, um, because I think that this is a continuation of a legacy of work, of organizing work, and Chicago is an organizing city. You have the Chicago Federation of Labor, we're still a blue city, and kind of red state, <laughs> we're holding on to that. 
Um, but we are a blue city, um, and that comes with strong unions. So shout out to the union organizers that are in the building. Um, yeah, shout out to the union organizers. Um, and I want to up, lift up a few other names, because this is a unique story. I'm, I'm in Ferguson, running across a field, doing a direct action. Cornell West was there. And I look to the left, and this is 12 o'clock at night. And there's N. Hey Choi, my instructor, running across the field. Right? This is in the middle of the night in Ferguson during an uprising. I'm like, what are you doing here? She's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, I don't know. Let's run. OK, all right, we're running. Um, that's the type of leadership we need right, at the end of the day. But that story is important because I want to lift up names like Mike Brown. I want to lift up names like Rakia Boyd. Um, I want to lift up names like Laquan McDonald because we do not get here, um, and we don't get Charlene Carruthers from BYP 100, who shut the city down summer after summer. Paige May, who shut the city down summer after summer. Um, without uh, the uprisings that came behind the loss of those lives. Um, and so those, those, that loss of life has also played a part in this administration's success. There was the galvanizing of thousands and thousands of people taking it to the streets demanding change um, around the death of Laquan McDonald. Um, and they saw some of the, uh, they saw the, the possibility of that change in, in, a, in a Johnson administration. Um, and so I think all of that work plays a part in how we got here today, along with you know, the unions, the, the organizing community, robust community organizing networks, uh, throughout the city of Chicago, and unfortunately, the loss of many lives um, that, that played a part in this as well. So that's my piece. Hello, everybody. My name is Vanetta Mansfield, and I am a retired union side labor lawyer. Alongside my career in all the picket lines and protests I went on, dragged my children to, I was involved in volunteer work that, that has really been to build active and thriving, an active and thriving social justice movement in this country and now in Chicago. After I retired and moved to Chicago, I got interested in investing in progressive politics. I was a board member of Arise Chicago. I was constantly with faith members before employers, um, places of work, demanding back pay, demanding them to allow their employees to organize, um, including at Republic Window. <laughs> um, I, and as part of this, I pushed uh, two years ago for the creation of the Jewish Council of Urban Affairs Votes, which is a 501c4 that has been part of the progressive movement and has endorsed and supported progressive candidates, many of which I went door to door for. I think Chicago is unique. I think Chicago is incredibly unique. I understand um, New Yorkers, organizers in New York are quite jealous of us. Uh, <laughs> we're unique in that faith, laborhood, uh, sorry, sorry, faith, labor, neighborhood, community, and grassroots groups are all working together in progressive on progressive political policies and to elect progressive candidates. Jay Shue and all the groups here, and many more that are not here, have very much been part of this growing movement that brought communities together, that resulted in not just the historic election of Brandon Johnson, but also the election of many progressive members of the city council. This took decades of organizing, which many people here have spoken about, across coalitions, community, and labor. It makes total sense to me that Brandon Johnson was an organizer, and is an organizer. Um, I also want to add that this, this movement, this university, and this ability to create organizers and create social justice champions like Richard is why we created the Mansfield Institute for Social Justice. <coughs> we, want, we want the students coming out of Roosevelt University to be activists, 
to understand that we need to create a better Chicago and a better country. We need to keep growing into communities that have not yet, that do not yet feel connected with this movement and build up more and pass more winning policies. We know that there are many communities that are not yet equally at the table due to racism and disinvestment in communities. So I want to ask a follow-up question, and I, I sort of invite anybody who wants to answer. It doesn't have to be everyone, but it can. Um, and some of you talked about this in, in your opening comments about referencing power building strategies without maybe necessarily using that phrase. But since we're a group of organizers, I'd love for you, uh, somebody to talk about um, what kinds of power building strategies have you seen be impactful over these years? And also to start to transition us into the current moment, what do you think is needed more of in this moment? Um, to keep to keep building and to keep winning the vision that we have. Um, I can jump in. I I don't know, and I'm not going to entirely answer your question, Amisha. Sorry. Typical. Because I think typical part of the critical thing, and I think what's been like just reflecting on what I've heard from everybody here, is a question of being able to take different strategies, figure out how they fit together and work together, um, whether you think of it as kind of like innovation, whether, you, like, you know, one of the key things is to be open. There is no roadmap, there is no clear path. We can take lessons from history, we can take lessons from, you know, the present, um, but we have to, you know, to be, like, totally honest, we have not, like, figured out a way to build that power in a lasting way. And so we can take some of those lessons, and I think part of what I've always thought about is thinking creatively, um, thinking about building new strategies all the time, and thinking about being open to those strategies and interventions coming from unexpected places, thinking about building power from the grassroots, really being open to democratic organizational structures, um, and being comfortable with an amount of messiness and contradiction. I think just kind of taking a look at the history of organizing since my uh, engagement, right? And um, so I feel like our movement is, cons is consistently maturing. It's growing, right? I think it started with activists, people that maybe weren't even organizers that were on the ground. They were just like, this is bad. I want to change this. That's the analysis. It's bad. I, this isn't right. <laughs> um, and then that grew into, okay, well, we can actually make some decisions. Um, but then those decisions were limited, right? And then they're like, okay, we need an electoral strategy because if you were in office, then we could actually implement this. Okay, boom. When we got, then we got to have a, uh, an electoral. Then we began to learn about electoral processes. Um, in addition, they're like, oh, well, we need our folks in the in the in the classrooms educating. So you see some movement folks from 2010 that are that got their degrees and now they're PhDs and they're professing. So they're going to be teaching the next generation of movement and activists and leaders. And then we also got some of our folks that advanced into. Uh, philanthropy, philanthropy, which is a new notion, right, that are actually in the, you know, I'll go to a, uh, I'll apply for a grant and meet somebody that's more radical than I am, right? And that wasn't the case 10 years ago, right? But through that, you start to see the, 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 uh, the growth of grass-led organizations all across this country. Organizations that used to have to do this with no funding now have the resources and the infrastructure to do this with power. Um, and so I think that's kind of the, the power is, it's, it's not something that can be uh, calculated in any particular way, but it's just kind of like the growth, like from infancy to, to now of a movement that is like, okay, we need all of these tactics in place in order to do this work effectively. I think in this iteration with the Johnson administration, I think we're gonna learn more about, okay, what did we learn from this and what can we do better next time, right? Because I remember landing on body cams and being like, that's all we got. After all of this uprising, it's all we got. And it was like, okay, we're gonna have to do more than just body cams, right? And body cams weren't, it wasn't a failure, it was just this was our first attempt, right? And so I think about this moment as being an attempt at doing something, it will not be perfect, but I do believe there's gonna be a lot of lessons that come out of this that advance this, this broader vision of movement making for the future. I 
I'm gonna jump in here. I, I think what's also been really important is base building in communities, especially during non-election season times, and like building even after post-elections. Can you say what base building is? Yes, being able to, it's, for me, it's like knocking on a lot of doors, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people in the community and bringing them in and creating a structure for them to like plug into like the organizing or conversations or resources that we are putting together to like offer the community and to use that as a space and mechanism for folks to challenge power dynamics either within that neighborhood, ward, or the city, um, and really using it as a tool to continue to engage folks in different campaigns. And I feel like in Chicago, a lot of folks throughout the city have been able to like base build and use the momentum from elections or use the momentum from camp issue-based campaigns like Treatment Not Trauma or Bring Chicago Home, et cetera, to really like engage folks on like what it means to be a safe and thriving Chicago. And I think that really allowed us to mobilize fast and largely during Brandon's campaign, especially during the runoff. Um, the amount of canvassers and volunteers we had was bananas and it was, it was really great because door knocking is like not fun in the winter. <laughs> or when it's really cold, so it was really great that folks were excited to talk to their neighbors about what it meant to have a safe and thriving Chicago and who was the best candidate to help get us there. I could just go really quickly. I, I just want to hop on that statement that this is a year-round process. Building coalitions and then translating that into electoral politics, you have to keep going. You have to go... So I'm going to give a good example of something I've worked on for years. So I've, for years, I've been working on Bring Chicago Home. And as we know, Bring Chicago Home just passed out of the city council. For people who don't know what Bring Chicago Home is, it is a system where the transfer tax for homes over a million dollars, just that amount over a million, will be taxed at a higher rate in order to fund homeless shelter and wraparound services for the homeless. I mean, you don't have to go very far in this city. <laughs> and because it's a tax initiative, that means it's gonna be on the ballot. And that means that we have to knock on many, many more doors and explain why this is important. But hopefully we built this base all year long by talking about what this means, if you don't, I mean, you can walk downtown and you see homeless, you can walk, in my neighborhood, there's uh, under every viaduct, there's homeless. Um, I think that we need to engage. We have to have community forums, we have to have coalitions, and we have to reach out to places that we haven't reached out to yet. And um, I, there's a lot that gives me hope because we did translate it into electoral politics. I particularly worked on the campaigns of Desmond Yancey and Angela Clay, and I'm so excited that they are on the city council. But there's a lot more to do, and we know that. That Brandon is a vehicle for us. Brandon, he, if he can get these things through city council and the progressive council members can get it through city council, then we have to go out there and do the work. And it is our job to keep building coalitions and to go out there and knock on doors. So that moves us into the next question of the current moment and our reflections on the current moment. Um, Benetta, you spoke a little bit about what gives you hope, bring Chicago home. But that's my question to all of you is, what, what is giving you hope in this moment? And conversely, what keeps you up at night? because there's still a lot yeah. to do, right? Um, and so would love to just hear, you know, again, about four minutes each of, of what, what is, what's giving you hope, 
what keeps you up at night. And of course, we're going to be stay focused on Chicago. We know U.S. foreign policy affects what's happening here in Chicago, and there's a lot happening in the world in this moment. But I invite people to think about, um, in the context of organizing and power building and, 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 and our movement, what, what gives you hope and what, what keeps you up at night? Benetta, if you want to add to your answer, yeah, and then we'll come yeah, back down. Yeah, I'd be down. happy to. Um, I'm going to go into what keeps me up at night, because I really <laughs> talked about what gives me hope. Um, what keeps me up at night is seeing these splits in the city council over the asylum seekers. It really keeps me up at night. It makes me very, very sad. And it also threatens our status in Chicago, which I think is important as a sanctuary city. We're a welcoming city. We've always been a welcoming city. My grandparents came to this city and were welcomed to this city. My mother came to this city and was welcomed to this city. I, I think it is sad and painful. And the migration to Chicago, as you said, Amisha, is fueled by global practices, flawed international relations, which the U.S. has been complicit in. In Chicago, we are dealing with the consequences of these actions. We, we cannot affect the global political culture and not the causes. We need to figure out how to talk to each other. We need to figure out how to talk rationally that giving housing to migrants is not taking things away from communities, but is adding to these communities is adding to the diversity just like my grandparents added to it. Um, yeah, I think what gives me hope is uh, the growth of our demands. Um, and one of those growths that I've seen over the past year is the demand for reparations. Um, and this is an historic demand. It's been in our back pocket since the beginning of time, right? And, and we've been, I mean, and so I feel like the experiments like what's happening in Evanston, um, experiments of what happened with the, the, if you haven't taken a look at what's going on in California, um, experiments of like what's happening right here in Chicago where Mayor Johnson has committed 500,000 to, to, to begin the process of establishing a commission on reparations in the city of Chicago. These are huge steps. And the reason I say that is that, you know, I organize equity and transformation. We organize in, you know, three primary areas in Chicago. That's Austin, Inglewood, West Garfield Park. All of these communities have per capita incomes nearly $20,000 below the average per capita income in the city of Chicago. Places like West Garfield Park have average per capita incomes of almost $14,000 a year, right? The average cost of living is like 2000 upwards of $2,000, and that's absent of rent. Right? So our people are literally starving in the city of Chicago. And so for me, when, you, when I start hearing answers or start hearing people actually speak the term reparations out loud, I also want people to understand what that means. It's not just a bag of money. The, the bag is important, no lie. It's, we want the bag. <laughs> but it is a commitment. The UN has defined it as a commitment to five things. That's rehabilitation, which our community needs desperately, restitution, which our community deserves. Compensation, there goes the bag. And then the last piece is a guarantee of non-repetition. And I recently wrote an article in the tribe that described that when you actually satisfy that commitment to a guarantee of non-repetition, you actually set in place in motion the conditions for a sanctuary city, right? And so for me, it is so important for us to actually begin to speak these things into existence and actually have progressive mayors that are actually open to the idea of it and then we need to advocate on the outside to ensure that it becomes uh, the last pillar which is satisfied um, in the eyes of the people who deserve it and who need it. So that's what's giving me hope. Only thing that keeps me up at night are my kids, so <laughs> we'll keep it like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like there are a lot of things on both sides of this. I'll point to Actually, uh, one of the UWF elected officials, um, who who I think was brought up by by uh, Stephanie earlier, uh, U.S. Representative Delia Ramirez in the third district, third congressional district, um, who I came to know as a housing organizer, as somebody in my neighborhood, 
um, who has now you know, been elected to the US Congress and is holding the challenges of this moment, not just this moment globally, uh, but this moment in Chicago. Um, very clearly as one of the chief sponsors of the ceasefire resolution um, in Congress. Um, as somebody who uh, is uh, of Guatemalan descent, as somebody whose parents uh, migrated from Central America, a country, or from, from Guatemala, a country that was ravaged by US foreign policy in the Cold War. Um, and, and so she has a really unique perspective, um, having grown up in Humboldt Park, as the daughter of, of Guatemalan immigrants. And I, I think that's a key part of that question is how do you link those things together? And that gives me hope, our ability to link together what is happening day to day here in Chicago or the beginning of that. And I could phrase it more broadly around the country as an awakening of a kind of progressive or left internationalism that we're seeing real, in a really challenging moment um, start to develop that is diverse and multicultural. One of the things that is keeping me up though is the opposite force which is that we see the possibility of a real multiracial right-wing formation. We see that very clearly, I think, in Chicago, particularly in the debate about migrants, but not solely in that debate. Um, and we see that, you know, as a, that is what poses a real danger, I think, to, to the political project that we are all engaged in um, and to, to some of the short-term wins that could really help us build the infrastructure um, to win much more. time to think about it and I'm still um, I think what I'm gonna start what keeps me up at night is the fact that we're having to govern within institutions that were not built for us to govern in and what brings me hope is that we are indulging in those tensions and are committed to figuring it out together okay you just said so much in eight words <laughs> I didn't even finish writing down the eight words. Okay, so let's dig into that. Can you, so can you, I invite you to say more on this because I do think this is a real question and tension around, you know, people have talked about the phrase co-governance as, you know, this, you know, obviously this big moment of opportunity here in Chicago and lots of questions, what does that mean? What does it take to actually do that? When, you know, a lot of us have, you know, say that, well, Co-governance isn't actually new. It's usually business and corporate interests that have been co-governing with elected officials in power over and over for, for decades. Um, say more about what you just said so I can finish writing those <laughs> words down. And um, I, To what you, I said that because I was thinking about what you had mentioned earlier, Misha, is that right now we're seeing the administration get attacks from all sides, including the left. That's not bad. I think it's always good that you're able to have the left flank continue to like push you and challenge you and push you to like bolder demands that we weren't calling for before because we had a center or like right administration that didn't allow us to like actually get to those bold demands. But now that we have someone who is willing to engage with us and push for those demands, I think there it's, there's a specific moment for us right now of power where we have to make those bold demands. We have the opportunity to do so, and I don't think that we should be using the old tools of governing to just settle for what we once thought were our once bold demands. I think that there's an opportunity for us to continue to like push, to continue to indulge in those tensions, and it's not personal, right? And I think that we're hearing it from the community. It's like, this is great, what's next? And how do we continue to like build there? There's a lot of agitation from the right. How do we redirect the people who are upset about the lack of resources in Chicago right now that are going to like asylum seekers to redirect them to be like, no one's paying, I don't, I don't remember a time where people have paid this much attention to the news in like forever. Like everyone's, my, my parents are watching the news again. And it's like everyone's so on top of like what's happening in Chicago policy that like we have the opportunity to redirect that power to actually win really bold things um, for the city. So 
opportunity to be more bold and to like harness that agitation in the moment we're in now. I want to just see if any of the other three folks want to add anything to this thread of the conversation. Otherwise, I can ask a different question. Maybe it would be good to explain co-governance to this audience. Like, uh, it, the, the lesser thing, I mean, JCUA votes is, is a big thing about co-governance. But, you know, co-governance is a form of accountability to the people we elect, but it is also having a seat at the table, and I think it is very hard to achieve under the current systems. And so I think that it might do us a little bit to explain to this audience what co-governance is. And let me add to that as the next, maybe a next question until the mayor joins us, which is, Maybe we could talk grounded in some specifics of, in the administration so far, what have you seen has been powerful about how community and labor has been um, playing a role in the successes of the Johnson administration? Because there's been, I mean, some of the things are still, this is the budget stuff that are still up. I can't remember stuff. Like, the things that have happened in the first, what, what has it been, eight, eight months of the administration, seven months have been, been things that like we've seen decade, not, um, multiple administrations in the past, like we've not seen the same level of progress as we have in the first like six months of the Johnson administration. And I um, would love to like get into a little bit from your perspective of what has been the role of community of, of labor in making those wins happen as a way to like name what, co kind of show what co-governance actually has been. I, d I do think co-governance is, it's a pretty simple, I think there's like a, it, there's no blanket definition of it, but it's a, it's a relatively simple concept of, it's how we think about like a democracy should function. There should be actors who represent, you know, we elect people to represent us, and then we have other actors and institutions. Um, it's just that, as it was said before, institutions that are led in undemocratic ways by elite leaders are the ones who have been co-governing, where what we have is an opportunity to have people who actually represent working people um, in that conversation. And I'm thinking back to, I forget which city council meeting, but just like to advance reparations, treatment, not trauma, bring Chicago home, you know, the worker protections that the Johnson administration has passed on, ending the tipped sub-minimum wage, um, and moving forward on paid time off, like these are things that we, any one of those advancing in a meaningful way would have been a really good year's work yeah. for this coalition in the last 15 or 20 years. And to see all of them advance and continue to move forward, that I think is kind of the evidence of co-governance, that there are people at the table who are trying to figure out what that bigger plan is and that we're able to actually move that in a way that also you know, touches kind of all of these different key issues, whether it's around housing, workers' rights, you know, there's, there's a set of these issues that are being advanced, not one pitted against the other, um, but a project of trying to advance them all together. I will just say that there there is tensions in the way that folks see co -co I see it as a spectrum within that democracy. It's like, am I informed, am I consulted, and am I involved in the decision making? And I think that folks do not agree at to like what level they're being integrated into each of those categories. And as movement, I think it's like, Again, these structures were not meant for us to be governing in. So like, how do we dismantle and create and build up new structures that allow us to participate in all of those three categories? I'd love to dig into the um, piece, Alex, that you said about what keeps you up at night as the multiracial right-wing coalition that's forming. Um, one, you know, if, if folks want to add in on that, but I'd love to talk about what's the antidote to that, right? Um, what is the, 
I think we many we could probably we know the why. I th I think we know the whys. But what is the like? What do we do? Um, what's what's necessary to combat that rise? Can I just put this in context a little? So I think that what's going on, particularly in the city council and in Chicago right now, feels very much like what happened under Mayor Washington and I did not live here then, but my husband did, is, is council wars. It feels like they're trying to start council wars. And it was, it was very destructive and we have to, as a group, we have to stop that. We have to figure out ways to get in there. I think that's very true. Um, Bennett, and, and I've reflected a little bit, and I don't wanna, I'll respond a little bit, I'll, I'll try to, you should cut me off, Amisha, if you need to, I know you're comfortable doing that. I, I do, th you know, council wars happened in a particular moment of black political power in a bunch of major cities at their apex. And you could look at this very cynically and say, once the neoliberals had started gutting, uh, manufacturing had started gutting many of our cities, they were willing to say, okay, uh, we can let black people run these cities because we are we are funneling all the money out of them right now. That happened in Detroit, in Chicago, in a bunch of Gary, in a lot of different places around the country. I think we're at a very different kind of historic moment broadly, in part because of the possibility of multiracial coalition building that in a lot of ways, like when Rich mentioned Fred Hampton earlier, and people think of Fred Hampton as a Black Panther, I think of that true but I think of him also as a leader of a multiracial coalition that was providing, that was like really presenting danger to the ruling class. I think of a Harold Washington as a leader that was building that kind of coalition. We are seeing the fruits of a lot of that happen, not just in Chicago, but in places around the country. And so the pushback is going to look very different. Um, I think we see that nationally in the ways that Donald Trump plays to different audiences because there is, like, there is to a lot of us um, or to a lot of people who haven't been paying close attention, they can be shocked at, at the occasionally what the diversity is of that kind of like right wing electorate. And so I think it's something that we have to be on the watch for. Chicago has been a leader in political trends, I think, in this country over the last hundred years. And so we can look at what is happening in Chicago right now and try to say, we need to stop this here um, before it becomes a reality um, more broadly. I guess I'll add to it. I think one of the things that keeps me up at night, I didn't mention, is you know, it's necessary for us as, you know, I think for folks that identify as progressives um, to build a class analysis and ensure that we're actually hitting the doors in the community and winning the people. Because I think the, the right is in a position where they're willing to expose our contradictions. You got 500,000 black folks that believe in this, show it to me. And if you ain't got them, then you sitting there with your 10 people looking weird. Right, and, and, so, and so it's really, if we're actually gonna be about building a multiracial coalition, it has to be about having a class analysis and doing the deep base building work. And this is the problem, this is the, the challenge for our movement is that the right is beating us on the ground, right? And that's where we gotta, we have to kick up the, we have to do a better job on the ground, actually meeting people on the doors, going to Austin, going to Inglewood, going to West Garfield Park, going to Bridgeport, going to Mount Greenwood, going to all of these places where they're organizing their people against us and organize our people, organize those people to our, to our line. And we can't, I mean, and also we have to, you know, yeah. So I, I feel like that's the most important thing is that the base building work is not just um, a superficial kind of number. It is deep relationship building with folks in community. And that's how you actually build that racial solidarity that's necessary to have a multiracial coalition and to have a model of co-governance where, the, where the, there should never be a moment where the Johnson administration says something and the people don't know exactly what he's talking about. Um, and that's, do, that's the only way that happens is through base building. And so we have to do that hard work of like winning our people to these ideas and also including their ideas in the, um, in, in the, in the process. So that's my piece.
Well, until someone comes on stage, I'm going to keep asking can questions. I, can I do oh. one quick self-promotion yeah, yeah, yeah. on the question of the right, too? Because yeah. in these times, we just put out, it's hitting doorsteps right now, a special issue on the rise of the far right. Um, so in these times.com, we've got a bunch of stuff on the website um, for a more deep uh, exploration. Watching him walk in. Okay, so while we wait, um, <laughs> Rich, you want to take, <laughs> take us back to your, oh, hello, okay. I'm going to turn it back over. We have an unknown guest here, the surprise <laughs> guest. <laughs> uh, well, we're honored to have Mayor Johnson joining us this morning. Uh, as you know, Mayor Johnson is the 57th mayor of the great city of Chicago. And most importantly, as our panelists have mentioned, and you see the budget. He has put the money uh, where it's supposed to belong. That statement about economic, racial, health, climate, restorative justice is how we progress in the city of Chicago. And just so that you, know, you will hear from him uh, in two seconds, I also want to mention to the mayor that besides the good work of our faculty and our students in the community on all of those issues, uh, our board of trustees this year decided that Roosevelt University needs to be more accessible to the families and the working class families who are hurt by COVID, by high inflation, by unemployment, and so forth. So we reduced our tuition by 40%. Yeah, yeah that, that, wasn't, that wasn't a misstatement. We didn't increase it by 40. We reduced it by 40% to make it more accessible to the working class. And therefore, we had a record number of applications and record number of first-year students at Roosevelt University. So with that, I will bring in Dr. Dalmich to get us introduced. Okay, I feel like you all know who's coming and <laughs> I don't need to do a big introduction. I do want to say one thing. Mayor Harold Washington, the 51st mayor of Chicago, was a Roosevelt alum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he taught here. So let's see, maybe the 57th mayor will want to teach here at some point. <laughs> um, so I will present uh, Mayor Brandon Johnson. And just quickly, so you know, he was an organizer with the CTU. You know anything about the Chicago Teachers Union, and you know they are bad ass. He, so he was an organizer. He was the Cook County Commissioner under his... Um, sort of uh, commissionership. He um, led the efforts to pass a just housing ordinance. He secured legal representation for immigrants facing deportation. He coordinated COVID-19 resources for low-income seniors in nursing homes. He also collaborated with colleagues to eliminate that oh so awful gang database. Mm. And then in the summer of 2020, he organized the Cook County Board to commit to the budget for black lives, bringing new investments in healthcare, public transportation, internet, and affordable housing. He lives in Austin, and he's here now. Welcome, Mayor. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, wow, this is great. This is, um, this is a, a better reception than my seventh graders would greet me every single morning. 
in the Chicago Public Schools. So thank you so much for being here and congratulations to all of you for your commitment um, to justice. What an incredible honor to be um, at one of the most esteemed institutions, um, a historic education institution here at the Rose Roosevelt University. And today's discussion, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I, I thank you for the job offer. Um, <laughs> I won't take an unnecessarily political petty dig. Um, I will say this though, I want to at least get reelected before I take on a role as a professor. Okay, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, you know, as one of the first universities to, to integrate in this city um, with an incredible social justice mission, um, that foundation is, is clearly sustainable. And if it were not for that foundation, um, this panel would not exist. Though I just want to offer up some advice to one of my um, brothers in the struggle. I looked at the headshots of all the panelists and uh, Alex Hahn, we gotta do something about his headshot. So let's, <laughs> I mean, I know some of y'all are getting used to a brother having on a suit and, and two haircuts a week, but you knew I was coming. <laughs> yeah, I see, you're stepping it up, but Professor Stephanie Farmer, of course, my friend Amisha Patel, and I've already acknowledged Alex Hahn and uh, Bonetta Mansfield, we had a chance to meet uh, a few years ago um, during the um, presidential election. At that time, uh, that was Senator Sanders and Warren running at that time, and of course, Richard Wallace, all of you for participating in today's conversation. I really want to acknowledge and lift up the, the students. Um, the Man Mansfield Institute um, is really about making sure that social movements remain and stay alive. And we often talk about how young people are our future. And I, I, I will not break out in song, <laughs> but you know it's important that we lift up the, the fact that the, the future um, is today and the work that you all are doing and your commitment to justice as young people um, know that the pathway ahead um, requires your participation today. And so the power to affect change and make an impact in all of our communities right now, um, we have to prove that the work that we are delivering can outlive us, just like our ancestors have done. And whatever desires that you have, whatever drives you or moves you, whether you want to combat climate change or um, eradicate poverty, build real humanitarian rights across the globe, to build safer communities, whatever your mission is, I'm confident that your journey um, is just getting started and the future of Chicago was better because of this institution. You know, the task will feel daunting <laughs> at times and it will feel great and even overwhelming. But I'm a living testament of what's possible through the power of people and unity. And I speak from experience, having overcome tremendous obstacles to become the 57th mayor of the greatest freaking city in the world, the city of <laughs> Chicago. Last October when I announced, I was polling at 2.2%. Boy, did they underestimate the power of people. And so, to build a campaign off the hopes and aspirations of people, that's what movements are about. And so I've learned some lessons, of course, in my career as an organizer, as a teacher, as a Cook County Commissioner, bringing people together. So we organized Chicago to knock on doors, to make phone calls, and to most importantly, to vote. My campaign was the reflection of a social movement that brought together all races, genders, generations, and communities working towards a common goal. And this movement was speared by generations of Chicagoans who've always wanted Chicago to be better than what they inherited. 
And so we amplified the voices of the most marginalized people. And we established what real solidarity looks like. And that this campaign was driven not just by our hopes and aspirations, but by real people with real experiences, and particularly our young people. 27,000 new voters in April voted in this election, all under the age of 34. I won by 26,532 votes. <laughs> so when the right wing extremists get upset about my election, I just say, talk to the young people. They're responsible for it. But we want our campaign building on a progressive coalition determined to destroy and to upset the status quo. And it was the energy and the aspirations of this generation that helped bring into fruition what ultimately has been proven to be an historic moment for the city of Chicago. The work continues though. I laid out a very ambitious agenda that ultimately is building us towards a better, stronger, and a safer Chicago. Now some people believe that my agenda is too audacious and too bold because we dare to invest in people. Imagine how wicked you have to be to believe that investing in people is too bold. And whether we're investing in jobs, economic opportunities, accessible health care that includes mental health care, quality education, affordable housing, community development, climate justice, these are all the points of which we are centering our movement around. And on top of all of this, we are bringing the city together in a way that will ultimately give us the power and the ability to have a real shared humanitarian approach towards all of the crises that we inherited and the ones, of course, that are around the corner. And whether you are seeking asylum or whether you are seeking justice, now three generations from those who have been here for some time, that I'm confident that there's more than enough for everyone. And yes, it's a lot of work, don't get me wrong. My schedule is indicative of, of all that work. But there's nothing we can't accomplish if we stick together. And so as we continue to build this multiracial, multi-generational interfaith movement, know that co-governance and collaboration is at the center of this work. That there's real shared responsibility for all of us. And so the leaders that are in this room, the organizers that are, that are in this room, those that are following the footsteps of Mayor Harold Washington or Marion Stamps or Chairman Fred or President Karen Lewis or Reverend Jesse Jackson, these are organizers that made today possible. What will the next 100 years look like? The next group of students that come through this institution, will they look back at this moment and recognize the power that we built together to set them up for the fights that they will inevitably have. And so I'm confident though, the coalition building that has brought us together in my campaign as mayor will continue to ensure that families, businesses, and individuals, all who love this city can thrive in this city. And as we discover today how we continue to build our power, I wanna stress the power that lies within our communities. Those who have been harmed by policies, are the best people positioned to transform policies to bring real support and transformation to those communities. And so in closing, the movement must continue to educate and to spread awareness about our cause, to strengthen the movement by forging alliances with other groups and individuals. We have to continue to mobilize and rally and march and build organizing through the grassroots efforts and to be strategic about laying out a real clear vision of our goals and making sure that our actionable steps lead towards achieving real progress. And this is how we continue to build power. And with this power, we can actually affect policy. With this power, 
We can pass treatment, not trauma, did that. With this power, we can bring Chicago home, did that. With this power, we can make sure that paid time off becomes a reality, did that. With this power, we can eliminate sub-minimum wage, did that. With this power, we can make sure that we hire more young people, did that. With this power, we can build up a coalition to bring real restoration and reparations to people who have been harmed, particularly black folks, did that. With this power, we can pass a $16.77 billion budget invested in people without raising your property taxes with this power. Did that. <laughs> Thank you. Like I forgot I'm supposed to talk. That was so good. Um, so we've got a set of questions from us to the mayor. Um, we're going to start with Benetta and come down to me um, to basically build off of a lot of what you spoke about just now to us. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Benetta to kick us off. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> um, as mayor, what do you see as your role in building coalition? What has been the biggest challenge and where do you see the biggest successes? And I think you just, you know, <laughs> your shoulder must be sore. <laughs> well, well, thank you for that, that question. Look, the, the unique position that I'm in today is that I get to convene people of all walks of life. Um, as you all know, in the city of Chicago, we are not sh short on political theory or thought or aspiration. And I think what where I see that there's tremendous opportunity. This budget, though, you know, we passed our first budget, which means I have 23 more budgets to pass. <laughs> Let that sink in a little bit. <laughs> um, Good Kids Mad City and the Civic Committee both supported this budget. Now, if you know anything about those particular political positions of these two um, institutions, um, it is safe to say that both of these institutions have very different paths in which um, they are calling for equity and justice. Um, you can make the argument that one is more focused on equity um, and justice. Um, and so to be able to convene people of all walks of life and as well as from various industries, that's the opportunity that I have to, 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 to build coalitions. I mean, as far as, you know, where there, there are challenges is that all right, so I'm going to admit something today. I'm a big HGTV person. <laughs> I do. I just, I, I, I'm, you know, when you're 47, you just accept the fact that you're going to turn into your father any day now, right? <laughs> and so I don't know if you all watch. This is a very shameless plug for Property Brothers. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the challenge is, is it's, it's like Chicago is this beautiful home with a pretty nice kitchen and a pretty decent bathroom. But... In order to make it work for 21st century, you might have to knock some walls down and excavate a little bit. And once you knock those walls down, you see behind those walls where there's been mold and challenges and damage, where you see toxicity. Now, the unfortunate thing about being mayor of the city of Chicago is that you don't get a commercial break <laughs> like the Property <laughs> Brothers. And so as we continue to dig up and, and, and tear down some of these structures, the low bearing those dynamics stay in place, but as we work around the, the, the entire city of Chicago, we're gonna uncover what neglect looks like. And that's gonna take some work, one fine point on that. As I've assessed all of the closed schools that two administrations ago did, some of those schools, in order to get them operational again, will cost the city anywhere from 12 to $15 million. That's how much damage has been left right in the middle of neighborhoods because of failed policies. These are our challenges now. And so I'm, I feel good you know, knowing that there are experts around us to help us do this work, but just understand that the work is going to be substantial. It's going to require all of us to make sure that we build a house that works for everyone and that it's affordable. See how I did that? <laughs> uh, hello, Mayor. Richard Wallace, founder of Equity and Transformation, Eat. 
And we organize in three communities, Austin, Inglewood, West Garfield Park, majority of my, majority black communities. And when we knock doors, we don't have many folks that identify as progressives, right? And so what does a progressive administration mean to black, for black folks in black communities? Yeah, that's a great question. And I appreciate, you know, you know, Bonetta and I had this conversation during the Elizabeth Warren um, campaign. And, and, and what I've expressed to people that with all due respect to Senator Sanders and Senator Warren, healthcare for all, you know, that was an idea that was put forth by the Black Panther Party. You know, before, you know, the government was committed to feeding children before they started school, that was an effort led by Chairman Fred and the Black Panther Party. You know, when, I, when, we, when we talk about affordability and particularly around housing, when Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. came to Chicago, he, he experienced resistance like he had never experienced before. And, and what he was getting at is not that racism took on a slightly different form in Chicago, it's that it was in your face. Mm -hmm. Typically, like in the South, you had you know, your sheriffs and sort of your political players who were very clear of carrying out white supremacy. In Chicago, it's like the dude next door, <laughs> right? So like you could walk down the street and you wouldn't have to necessarily duck from law enforcement. You would literally have to duck from people who lived on the block who didn't want to see you there. And so Dr. King made it very clear, if we can figure out housing in Chicago in, or in everything related to justice, and particularly when it comes to liberation for black people, we could do it anywhere in the world. Those are his words, right? And so when we talk about progressive politics, you can't talk about progressive politics without talking about black liberation. And for me, that, that is progress. W.B. Du Bois said that public education at the expense of the state, after all, is a Negro idea. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about public accommodations, the last point, after the Civil War, there were five dynamics that the descendants of slaves wanted the government to respond to. Housing, healthcare, education, jobs, uh, mis transportation. Now, in the 21st century, we would respectfully add climate. Um, I, would, I would add climate justice, food equity, right? And so all of the progress that has been made in this country has been centered around the question that has been asked from the beginning of the inception of this so-called experiment of these United States. What to do with the Negro? As we answer that question, we are ultimately building a more progressive, liberated state of existence. It doesn't happen without the story of descendants of slaves. And so to, to, to be in the embodiment of that history, to get elected on the day in which Dr. King was assassinated, I believe that our ancestors and the, and the earth is speaking to the city of Chicago, ultimately speaking to the world, that progressive politics is centered around black liberation. And that was a, a really good lead in to my question, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I'm not gonna, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk later. You can take some shots at me. I'm, Go not, ahead. I'm not doing Look, it right now. You got a haircut, I'm I not. got a haircut. It's all different now, Alex, I get I'm it. My, I'm gonna get my shoe shine next. <laughs> so there's been obviously a long arc of struggle for freedom in Chicago, and Chicago has produced from my perspective, and I think yours too, an outsized share of black leaders of multiracial coalitions. Examples like Fred Hampton, Harold Washington, Jesse Jackson, your mentor Karen Lewis, all of them led groundbreaking political movements that were really attempting to contest for power in a multiracial uh, way. How do you situate yourself in that lineage of black leadership? Wow. Um, yeah, so when I was up here, like, you know, dusting my, you know, shoulders off, you know, I, I wasn't literally trying to, like, imbibe, you know, the incredible history that you just laid out, you know. And I'm very humbled by the question because, you know, you don't wake up as an organizer thinking one day that you're going to be a part of a book study. What I will say, though, to that point, I'll try to answer this as humbly as I possibly can. The other day ago, we, um, we lit, um, lit up the, uh, the city uh, on the Magnif Magnificent Mile, and there were just hundreds, if not thousands, of people lined up 
And as we were walking in the parade um, I, uh, along the route, there were a group of students, probably between the ages of first and third grade. And as I was walking, this, this group of uh, children began to scream and point at me and say, that's, that's Mayor Johnson. We're studying about you in school. <laughs> and, and I thought for a second, I really hope that chapter two is better. <laughs> but I guess what I'm saying is that I do recognize that for, for the names that you just mentioned, that there is a generation that is further removed from, from that era. And they're gonna be looking for their modern day examples. And so what I believe it's incumbent upon us is to demonstrate how those leaders made sure that the young people who were pointing at me played a part in their own liberation. And that, you know, I, I'm grateful that I don't have to save anyone. That's not my responsibility. I don't have that burden. What we do have to do is to make sure that those who have been marginalized see themselves in this collective struggle and know that the strength that those leaders provided, that I have to do that as well. That, you know, when the days get difficult and the, the pressure mounts, and as the mayor of the city of Chicago, it's the only office where you are literally blamed for everything. <laughs> and that's what I do love about Chicago. Like, if the gas prices are too high, if it snows, <laughs> There's traffic. It's like, come on, mayor, man, I voted for you. Why is this snowing, right? But regardless of how the pressure comes, those young people, much like what I saw in Reverend Jackson and Karen Lewis, they were human. It was tough, but it didn't stop Karen Lewis from calling out the mayor at that time. It didn't stop Reverend Jackson from calling out an entire political party. It didn't stop Chairman Fred for, 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 for beating back against the, the, the institutional dynamics that were squeezing the life out of people. And these individuals had life-threatening um, uh, uh, attachment constantly. So it's making sure that they see themselves and that we hold the line on not just being inspirational, but being honest about the power structure in which we're taking on, that this work, it ain't cute. It's hard and it's real. Thank you for that. All right, thanks. Mayor Johnson. Andrea. <laughs> And we have sat together in a lot of coalition meetings, fought for an elected representative school board, and you coming for movement to becoming the mayor has meant that you have gone from organizing against targets to becoming a target. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know, like, what has been your experience um, becoming a target as mayor and what do you want people to understand about the forces, the tensions, and also the contradictions that you have to navigate? Yes, that's a good question. And, you know, sometimes when I see the interactions, I, I hate that I'm going to admit this. Sometimes when I see the interaction and the attention at city council, and I'm on the dais, you know what I'm really thinking? When I was organizing, we did it like this. Y'all not even doing it right. <laughs> you know, to be in a building where, I mean, there's documentation. I think it, well, there's a picture with you and I together. I think Alex, where we're literally blocking the elevators, preventing people from getting to the fifth floor, and we're taking a rest in the very building in which now I'm managing. And I just want to lift that up because I don't want anyone to think that somehow I'm mayor of Chicago because we knocked some doors and we gave some speeches and we raised some money. I'm mayor of Chicago because there was real struggle and tension even within the movement to get to a point where we were able to push back against the power structure. And so when I think about myself as a target, and I say this with all due respect, 
to some I might be. As far as I'm concerned, there's still really a couple of major targets here. The question for me is, how am I positioned alongside of a target or targets that now have to come to me um, as the, represent, the, represent, the representative of the city of Chicago? There are still a number of people who are going to work hard to keep or institutions are gonna work hard to keep us from passing bringing Chicago home. There are still gonna be individuals who are going to push back against our message and movement to invest in people and challenging those with means to actually pay their fair share. And so what I do appreciate though is that, I'll say it like this, that even when I am the center of people's attention as my wife reminded me over Thanksgiving dinner, she says, you know people have political discussions over Thanksgiving dinner. I'm like, yeah. She's like, they gonna be talking about you, dude. <laughs> She's like, on Thanksgiving, you're gonna ruin people's dinner. <laughs> um, that I need the movement to continue to not just relate to me as a part of the movement, but to challenge me to push me because it's the strength and it's the fuel that I'm gonna need to be able to carry out our agenda. I'll close with this. I've been married for 25 plus years. My wife and I have had some disagreements along the way. My main goal, even during a disagreement, is to make sure that my wife is still talking to me though. I don't know if you all have been in a relationship, but if your partner stops talking, you in trouble. <laughs> So my thing is, as long as the movement is still yelling, we still okay. <laughs> That's a healthy marriage. Well, that's a great lead into my question, um, which is, you know, we do pin everything on our leaders, right? The one person that's going to fix it all, do it yesterday. You were supposed to do it before you became mayor. I remember some of the articles. Um, but what, what do you need us, right? What do you need from us to do the work that you need to do that we want to all do? Um, and where do you need the larger movement to make that collective work possible? Because I think there's an idea of like, we elected the most progressive, I think, the most progressive mayor in, in history of any major US city, I think, is you. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> and it's not, it's, not, it's not how power works, right? I mean, I think it's also, it's, um, anyway, so we actually, it is all of us that, is, that needs to be in motion to the point of what you just spoke about, that you need folks to not just relate to you, but also push you. But say more about what do you need from people, from a, it's a collective project, right? And we often get confused by it. That's a great question. In fact, um, you know, this is a question that movement has always struggled with. It's just a unique position now because um, that struggle has led to one of your own occupying the fifth floor and, and running one of the largest economies in the world. So there are probably at least three things. I, I, I guess as a teacher, I have to offer up at least three assignments. Um, I think the one is what, what I do appreciate about this iteration of our movement that we really took a lot of pride in studying the history of movement in Chicago and developing a political consciousness that provides the, the, the discipline that's needed to understand what power is and how to relate to it. And that, that could be a little um, cumbersome and it could be a little academic, but not to get too lost into that, but when I think about the United Working Families, the UWF, um, you know, after um, Reverend Jackson ran for president, there was a similar movement, it was called the New Party. I, I don't know if there are folks in this room that remember that. And, you know, Beto O'Rourke, who ran for governor in Texas, his father was a part of this, Senator Sanders was a part of this. What most people don't talk about is in 1992, Reverend Jackson was the presumptive nominee for the Democratic Party. I mean, the game had changed, right? And of course, you know, what happened after that, uh, a sort of a really an unknown governor um, goes to the Arsenio Hall show and it just sort of takes off from there. 
I'm lifting that up is because these social movements that have led into political power, they're not new. So it's important, it's incumbent upon the movement to study these political movements so that we can learn lessons from you know, what happened, whether it was in the 80s or, or even before then. The second dynamic is, and I think this is what our brother was getting at, um, building political power in neighborhoods who may not identify as progressive, but understand what liberation and justice needs to look like. And so it's gonna be coming upon the movement not to just to gain sort of a political consciousness and an awareness, to have some level of sophistication of how you attack or deal with a particular matter. You gotta go into the neighborhoods where you are most likeliest to gain the most support. If you look at every ballot initiative that's been progressive, let's take the fair tax for instance. Black Chicago voted in favor of that overwhelmingly. When you ask about many of these progressive causes and you talk to black folks, especially a black woman, I mean, th these are individuals who are natural allies that have to be engaged. Then I think the third and final thing is, try to have a little bit of fun, y'all. We won. <laughs> Let's try to have some fun. And what I mean by that is, we have to celebrate our victories and our wins along the way. Even if we take a blow. Someone asked me, and I'll close with this, you know, what is it like you know, running the city of Chicago. In some instances, it feels like a boxer where you get, was it three minutes? You're battling back and forth. You take a couple of blows, you land a couple of punches, you go in the corner, someone rubs some things in your face, you spit your mouthpiece out, and they say, ding, 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 get back in there and fight again. <laughs> like that, that's just the, the daily routine. And so, having an opportunity to gain political consciousness, to organize in communities you know, where we have been negligent or reluctant, um, and then to enjoy one another. There's enough pressure from those who oppose us. We have to alleviate some of the tension and the breakdown that happens within our movement, and the way you do that is by celebrating one another. Thank you all very much. He needs to go. So we have time now for question and answer with the panel. Um, and oh, just raise your hand. We're going to bring the mics around. I don't know how many of you read the Obama's The Audacity of Hope. But when he was an organizer, one of the rules he learned was never let go of the mic. You let go of the mic, and so we will be holding the mics in our hand, and you can, but we will bring the mics around the room. You raise your hand. Amisha is going to moderate, so she'll direct us where to go, and, yep, and Stephanie and I will have the mics. Hello? Oh, it's working. Um, thank you for this wonderful panel. It's nice to hear the mayor. Um, my name's Kenneth Newman. I'm class of 86 from Roosevelt. I'm from the south side. So I work in sports, mostly soccer. And one of the things I wanted to ask this panel, do you understand how Chicago public schools have had major athletic facility deserts for decades, which has been a direct correlation to uh, basically juvenile delinquency. So what I'm asking you is, are you in a position to advocate for more athletic facilities? I do this work already, and would like to talk with you about it later. The work that I do, I think it's really important to continue to like push our institutions and bodies of government to really reimagine the way that we are funding our schools and making sure that they're fully funded. And like looking at the way that CPS currently funds our schools through student-based budgeting, that's not enough and it's not equitable. The state has to fund more into equi like EBF, like evidence-based funding, but also like CPS has to move towards a model that is able to fund wraparound services for all schools and not just the wealthy ones. 
and that would include offering more funding for extracurricular activities and for sports and for academics and for whatever else is needed for our families and our students. So yes. Um, good morning. I bring you greetings from Corliss Early College STEM High School. I am the program manager at Corliss, and I am a direct, or our, our students are a direct beneficiary of the $76 million that was towards the $4,000 use. Um, last year, normally we have to, we have um, summer internships where we were able to hire 12 students. Last year, we were able to hire 46 students, and so that was a, a benefit of $86,000 in our community for the summer. So um, my question to you is what I've noticed as we are scaling up um, this opportunity for our students, um, where should we go for additional opportunities? Because what I found is as I've scaled up from 12 to 45, I would like to provide opportunities for our students that are career-based and that are really poignant instead of staying at the school and cleaning up and doing things that are not necessarily gonna help them for their future. Andrea. <laughs> uh, I, I think about um, at the organization I'm at right now through like One Summer Chicago, we subgrant funding out and work with like community-based businesses to like have like young people like learn and like work with them over the summer. And a lot of them come back after the summer job to like work their full time and to continue to like learn while they're in school or after school. I think it's also like important that we're listening to like young people and the young people like Good Kids Matt City and other youth across the city who are calling for more like investments and really taking the lead off of like what they need and meeting the moment. It's like if we have the funding and the opportunities to do so, how do you all see this expansion year round and what are the services that you need, but also like making sure that we're engaging with all community stakeholders in that decision making as well. And I would add, send them to eat. Um, <laughs> send them now, I mean like we, so we have a Freedom Summer Fellowship every year and we train people on the, the skill of organizing, like door knocking, canvassing, phone banking, and they get practical application on like field organizing. Um, and so that's a fun, I mean, it's, it was fun for me. It takes, it takes, I mean, I was really happy to learn it. And so it's also a skill that, it's a life skill, permanently. If you live on a particular block and you want to see your community get a speed bump, you start knocking the doors on your block and you say, hey, let's go talk to City Council X to get this done. So it's a life skill, but at the same time, it's, you know, we have a program that happens every summer. We welcome new people every year doing that same work. Any other questions? If not, I have more. Yeah. There's someone here in the front. Hi, my name is Leah. I am a public administration master's student here at Roosevelt. And one thing that I was kind of thinking of when we were talking is like, it's great that Chicago is a progressive place, but how do we, like, I come from rural Iowa, how do we get people who are progressive to go out into rural Iowa and other places in the country and kind of hear the message of progressivism and what progressivism can do? Because it's great if we have a whole bunch of uh, progressive activists in Chicago, but like, what about the rest of the country? Because Chicago can't do it all by itself. I, that's a really good question, um, and I do like we can't. One of the challenges is we we can't actually accomplish all this change just in Chicago. Actually, the mayor brought up something like the Fair Tax Initiative, which had it been up to the voters of Chicago would have passed overwhelmingly, but because it was a statewide initiative, um, we ended up losing that that election, um, that that uh, close election. Um, I do think like in Iowa, for instance, and I've got a bit more of a national view, I think these days than I have in the past, but uh, I think of an organization like Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement. I think of some other organizations that in a very different kind of political structure and place are doing similar work to 
Brighton Park Neighborhood Council, to the Grassroots Collaborative, to EAT. There are other organizations that are like that. I do think that Chicago sets a tone and a model. And it is the birth, like it is, like it's the birthplace of the modern labor movement. It's the birthplace of community organizing. It's also the birthplace of neoliberalism. And so what we can do in Chicago, I mean, you know, Milton Friedman, Saul Linsky, and you know, like all of these things. So, so I do think we can think about how do we expand out from Chicago? How, it's also, you know, it's a place that is a magnet for people from around the country and around the world. Um, and so I do think we have to be thoughtful about how we're communicating and learning lessons back and forth um, with others, particularly in red states and in more conservative areas. I have a question. So we have a lot of students here. How, what would you do to recommend um, how they can get involved in these kinds of, um, like either community organizations, unions, um, anything that can plug into this multiracial working class movement? Rich. Yes, <laughs> all right. So Maurice Woodard is in the back along with Nicole Laporte. That's our operations coordinator and Nicole Laporte runs our communications. Talk to them. Um, we have a number of programs and we, we don't say no to people. We really have, I mean, we, we need help. Whatever it is that you do, I'm sure that we could benefit at the organization by doing that. And so my first job in organizing came through, and hey, she slipped the job description on my desk and I wouldn't apply it, and it was for nothing. It was very little money. <laughs> um, and so, it, I mean, but it was an opportunity to get my foot in the door and actually see change. And so, yeah, plug in, and then we also have a membership base. So if you wanna become a member of Equity and Transformation, you can become a member. Our members are generally black and formal workers. If you're not, you can click the other button that says, I want to be an ally. And as an ally, you can still show up, and we do mutual aid activities all throughout the city. And the one thing I wanted to say about the downstate piece is that Eats in Joliet, and we also recognize the importance of being all the way across state. We did, Maurice will tell you better than I will, but we did forums all throughout the state, including Carbondale, Illinois. And so we know that it's important, but it's also hella different there. The politics are extremely, what you can say boldly in Chicago, you kind of whisper in, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> in Carbondale. So it's like, and so it changes. But like, yes, one, if you would like to join, we have a website, but we also have folks in the back. And so, you know, meeting people is important. Holler at them and like, yeah, come volunteer. Yeah, I, I would add that you can go to unitedworkingfamilies.org. There is going to be a big campaign to pass the Bring Chicago Home um, referendum for the march. There's a lot of contests in that pri in that March primary, um, but Bring Chicago Home is one of the big ones. And so there are a lot of ways to get involved and plugged in there. Yeah, I was just going to add that uh, Jewish Council of Urban Affairs will also be every single weekend putting people out on the streets to get to knock on doors to get a vote on Bring Chicago Home and on the election. So. I don't know, when, when I was a student, every waking minute was organizing or organizing for elections or organizing, period. So I think it's one of the best things you can do. So um, I'm gonna ask y'all to do a final two minutes each um, on any sort of reflections, thoughts of, of where do we go from here? What do you think is needed over the next set of years or immediate, right? Immediate campaigns um, like Bring Chicago Home and beyond. Um, but yeah, where do we need to go as a movement? How do we get there? Um, it's a big open question. So wherever you wanna take it as like one or two things that come to mind of of what's needed as we move forward. I'll start off. Um, I think about like cities like Barcelona and other countries in Latin America and how the pendulum has kind of just like swung from like far right to the left and back and forth, but that hasn't stopped people on the ground from like organizing and from like pushing. And I think it's gonna, it's a lot of tri trial and error and everyone's like, we're looking at Chicago as like, we're learning from you, like how'd you do it? Trial and error. <laughs> and it's, it's really hard and I don't think there's really like a roadmap, but I, like to what Alex has said earlier, it's really important that we're sharing the lessons that we learned because politics, as Rich said, it looks very different in like, we're like outside of Chicago. Like Chicago, I think is like very unique, and like we've been able to like build and 
within like our ecosystem. So it's like, how are our lessons transferable to like other cities and folks across the country and world? And how are we also learning from Barcelona who is very different around like their structures of co-governance and how we could apply and learn from them also here in Chicago? Um, yeah, I, I think we've, we've got a lot of work ahead and nobody has uh, successfully accomplished it before. So I think we need to have some recognition of like that context. Um, I do think we have to make strides in how we think about interconnected struggles. And I think we've done that a lot in the city of Chicago, but I think that reaches much further nationally and globally, because again, we are not an island. We cannot win victories here. Um, that will not be taken away if we can't win bigger transformation um, nationally and globally. And I think that we need to be gentle with each other. And I think, you know, we've all been through these, particularly these last three years, you know, three and a half years, we've been through something collectively together. Um, and it has sometimes like, it has brought out the best and worst, I think, um, in people and in humanity. But I think for us in the movement, we have to learn to be gentle with each other, take care of each other and ourselves, and then finally, open up as much space for people to enter that movement as possible. Like any issue that people are concerned about, anything that connects them with their neighbors and others in their community is a possible point of entry um, to this kind of electoral politics, to this kind of progressive activism and organizing. And we have to not put up artificial roadblocks um, to people who want to get engaged. Yeah, I would say that, yeah, this, everything, I shade everything that was said already. Um, I was thinking to myself, like, I feel like our, our movements are people that are come in our my generation of the movement. Um, we know clearly what we want to dismantle. Very clearly, we can name it. One, dun, 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 take it down, take it down, burn it down, whatever. But what we want to rebuild, we haven't mastered yet. We have to gain mastery around the alternatives that we want to build in this city, in our local areas, et cetera. And that's a skill set, that's a muscle that I think is, we've been so in the fight against moment, we haven't clearly been able to build to, you know, to, we haven't had the time to really experiment with the alternatives we want to see replace these systems, right? And so for me, I'm really, I'm, I, there's a lot of joy in, the, in that work though, right? And so I do think we need to celebrate, but we also need to get in the, in the process of like really understanding what co-governance looks like, right? Looking at different ways in order for the economy to work. Right, but we haven't really practiced those things. Like solidarity economy sounds really great, but how does it look in practice, right? Um, is there a place where we can have a micro experiment in a particular community to see what time banking looks like, right? And so for me, I'm really interested in those alternatives, those different practices, which I feel like we have some knowledge on, but we haven't actually put into implementation in any way yet. I don't have much to add, except that there's communities we haven't touched yet. And there's communities that we need to go out into, see what their issues are, and get them involved and understand the power in organizing and being able to work on issues and to ultimately lead to co-governance. And we have to reach all of Chicago. And, and I think that's the way we grow. As far as nationally, I think we have to make this really work in Chicago. And then we go out, I understand New York, is very jealous of what we've done in Chicago. <laughs> well, I, you know, I want to just as a kind of final word, I mean, I think the, the last answer, you know, the, the difference of having an organizer as a mayor, right, who knows that in terms of how we move forward, we have to build political consciousness, we have to build power and build relationships and speak to people, and then we need to celebrate. Like, I think it's such a, powerful roadmap and it like and with uh, the pieces that you all named here of breaking down barriers of um, of what are we for the creation part right we're so like or the beauty of organizing and where hope lies is in creative right create creating things and creating things that don't exist yet that we haven't imagined yet um, 
Thank you all so much for, um, for this conversation. And thank you all for, um, especially for those of you who stuck around after the mayor left, appreciate you all. Because um, there's a lot of jewel, there's a lot of beautiful things um, to, that were said here. Um, so, and much appreciation to Roosevelt University. I'm gonna hand it back over to Heather. Thanks. I do want to say, look around the room. What you're seeing are folks that are in the building at Roosevelt University that do not have an 11 o'clock class today. <laughs> you see the mass exodus, you just know. That's everybody that's got the 11 o'clock class. So um, thank you to this panel. Please join me in applauding. Amazing. Thank you all.